Welcome to Tower Sector Report. I'm David Beetson, and this week it's time to dish the dirt on dairying and take a check on China as the trade in fresh produce takes off. Well, table grapes, fresh onions, pears, the flow of produce from China to New Zealand is growing rapidly under new free trade rules. But wine growers and Hort New Zealand have concerns about biosecurity controls. And dirty dairying. That's the way the media is branding the nation's number one export industry. But is it a fair cop? Well, economists say that the surge in farmland conversions to dairy is putting stress on the nation's finances as well as its debt-burdened farmers. But environmentalists say that the real stress is on the ecology of our rivers and streams. And the dairy industry has been responding to the challenges by implementing a new effluent management program called Every Farm, Every Year. Our rural affairs correspondent, Drew Chappell, has been in the field checking on the progress. Head 30 kilometres northwest of Timaru in South Canterbury and you will find the Totra Valley, a green farming community typical of this part of the country. The Totra Valley Irrigation Scheme is a small subsidiary of the nearby Opua Dam and is comprised of 23 farmers across 1,600 hectares of pasture. Brent Isbister is the scheme's chairman and says in the 12 years since its inception the expansion has caused little visible fanfare locally, but made a huge difference to the farming landscape. In that area there would be four dairy farms. The balance are sheep, sheep and beef, cropping, and some dairy runoff farms. Each hectare is allocated about 0.41 of a litre per second, so they take that each day during the season. That works out to be about an inch a week per hectare, so that's more than adequate. Quite often guys don't use their full intake. Uh, in fact, I'm a dairy farmer in the region and I very rarely use more than 80% of my water allocation any one year. The Totra Valley Scheme is just one of the hundreds of locally developed irrigation cooperatives, giving farmers peace of mind around pasture growth during our harsh summer months. On Brent's dairy farm, irrigation has more than doubled the earning potential of the land and now supports seven local families. Yeah, there's a capital outlay and um, that filters back into community as well. So there's capital costs in doing that. And there's also um, higher farm working expenses in running an irrigated farm versus a dry stock farm as well. But that's also part of the trickle down effect of an irrigation scheme and how it affects the community in the, in the wider spread of things. As the reliability of water increases, the scope for expansion of dairy farms in both land and herd size grows too. New Zealand's milking herd now sits at just below 5 million head, spread across more than 13,000 farms, producing a staggering 13 billion litres of milk. Unfortunately though, that's not the only thing our cows produce. On average, a 500 kilogram animal will output around 50 litres of effluent every day. Multiply that across the national herd and you get a figure of nearly 100 billion litres every single year. Unfortunately, some of that will make it into our water. Part of the issue is that, uh, they, you know, in rough terms, that's about the equivalent of 15 humans per, per cow in, in terms of um, the effluent that they produce. So what we're really dealing with is, is uh, what we term a diffuse pollution. It's untreated uh, in terms of the way that it often enters the landscape and, and therefore comes out in um, streams or in groundwater uh, somewhere down, further down in the, in the sort of water cycle. Professor David Hamilton lectures at Waikato University as well as chairing the Bay of Plenty Regional Council's Lake Management Board. Professor Hamilton says on a farm with good systems in place effluent shouldn't really be a problem. Storage and redistribution onto pasture takes care of a large portion of the outflow and keeps the surrounding waterways clean. As you increase the stock densities then you pretty much get a linear relationship with the amount of, of effluent that you, you leach. Now one of the big issues is the intensification and the intensification involves more what we term external inputs. Um, and those are in the form of, uh, of fertilisers, so we've got a very rapid rate of increase of, of nitrogen fertiliser that we've seen over the past 15 or so years. And indeed it seems the message is getting through. 
Regional councils around the country have been reporting higher compliance rates, and news coming in from industry organisations like Dairy NZ and Fonterra is mostly good. Dairy NZ's Policy and Infrastructure General Manager Simon Tucker says the government's recent water policy announcements will make things easier for farmers looking to expand. I think it's, uh, it's a national policy statement that's got some strengths and weaknesses. I think as an industry we would have liked to see a little bit more strategy behind it, understanding water as New Zealand's key strategic advantage and, uh, and, and having more flow from that. But I think it's a, it's a useful document, it provides regional councils with a bit more clarity about how they should manage and that's going to provide the industry with more certainty about how things are going to stand going forwards. So on balance it's a useful step. Simon Tucker says the responsibility for continued improvement of our waterways should be shared equally between farmers and councils as they both also share the benefits from farming. We've put a lot of effort into working with regional councils so that rather than it being in a a situation where the regional council feels like it's a policeman, then the industry and the regional council are working together to solve problems. You know, and there's always going to be situations where um, we get the wrong outcome, a particular farmer has particular difficulties, but I think if you look at the overall picture, things have been getting better. Effluent non-compliance has been trending downwards in Southland, um, and that's in the face of an industry which has grown enormously strongly. So the message we're getting from the council is we love the economic wealth and development that dairying is bringing to Southland, but we need to work together to make sure that the environmental side is managed, and that's the way we're going. Significant non-compliance rates in the Waikato, for instance, have recently fallen as low as 12%, something which is being welcomed by the country's largest farming lobby group. That's all good news, for the future at least, but the state of our waterways as it stands now leaves much to be desired. As many as half our lakes and around 90% of our lowland rivers are classified as polluted, something which was put to Prime Minister John Key in a recent interview with Stephen Sacker for the BBC. You've clearly got problems of river pollution, you've clearly got problems with species which are declining, threatened with extinction. I don't actually totally agree with that proposition. I mean, for a start off, the population is getting larger and that creates some form of pollution. And yes, we have a large agricultural base and so as we've become intensifying our dairying operations, that's had some impact on our river quality. Politics aside, the fact is, many of our waterways are in trouble and dairying is not helping things. Professor Angus McIntosh and his team at Canterbury University have been analysing the health and state of the region's smaller waterways, as well as reviewing riparian management practices, and the news isn't great. We've been looking at the effectiveness of the current riparian management that's out there, and a lot of that isn't as effective as, as we might want it to be. And the first reason is that there's a lot of sediment in those streams, that it seems like over the last hundred years of agricultural development in Canterbury, uh, that through one thing and another, lots of um, bank erosion, modifications to channels, those sorts of things, there's a very large amount of sediment in there. And the sediment, we're talking about you know, sand, silt, those sorts of things, and that seems to be uh, having a really big negative effect on, on stream health. The team here has been measuring insect and plant life throughout the small feeder streams into the area's large rivers and lakes, and comparing data from the past with current levels. Professor McIntosh says while they haven't specifically targeted dairy farms in their research, it's waterways nearest to these properties that are showing the worst symptoms. It's likely that cattle are probably more damaging, particularly to stream banks, and you know for some of that sediment, those sediment impacts, than, than sheep and um, some of the other types of you know, arable land, horticulture, those sorts of things um, have been. And there are certainly some nutrient impacts associated with cattle, um, and particularly dairying, I guess, you know, because that's particularly intensive. But you know, our research doesn't necessarily point the finger at dairy. We haven't been appro uh, you know, approaching it from that point of view. I haven't gone and done some sort of land use evaluation and, and compared stream health with that. We've been looking at the streams that are out there. And, and the condition that they're in. Riparian planting and the fencing off of waterways is widely touted by industry as effective strategy to combat nutrient runoff. But Professor McIntosh says often the where is as important as the what. There's been a tendency to focus on the larger rivers or larger streams, you know, things that might be greater than two or three metres wide. We think the largest problems with stream health are probably in the smallest 
waterway channels. Things that you can walk over, quite often things that might be regarded as drains rather than streams, you know, that sort of thing. And um, the extent of planting and protection from particularly cattle damage or uh, stock damage to the banks um, is, is, is not very great. Professor McIntosh wants to see more funding put into research in order to establish the best way to tackle the problem. We do have a big problem in that the riparian management that we're doing isn't anywhere near as effective as it could be. You know, we've, um, there's been some fairly good robust reviews done in New Zealand and around the world recently and uh, the effectiveness of our current management is, is pretty variable and, and on the whole you know, it's reasonably poor. You know, so there is a really big need to improve our technology there. You know, we need to be able to figure out how we can design uh, better systems, um, design a waterways if you like, you know, how we can uh, work those waterways around farm systems and management systems and, and the kinds of mitigation, remediation, restoration techniques that we might be able to use. All parties agree action has to be taken, but the exact shape of that action is less certain. Right now, it seems our industry's future is as murky as our rivers. Drew Chappell reporting. We'll be back with more on the dairy industry's program to lift its environmental game right after this. Welcome back to Tower Sector Report. And joining us now, Emma Parsons. Emma is Fonterra's Sustainable Dairying Field Team Manager, working on the Every Farm, Every Year project that's checking dairy effluent systems to make sure that farms are operating in compliance with resource management requirements. Welcome, Emma. Thanks. Well, just last year, we had the Minister of Agriculture and Fonterra both say that pollution performance of the, of the dairying industry was, quote, totally unacceptable. What kind of reaction did that produce? You were out there in the field, you heard what happened. Tell me. So last year when the Clean Streams Accord results were released, um, we found that we were going backwards in terms of effluent non-compliance. And that was the second year that that had happened in a row. And at that point, you know, despite the fact that there were a lot of programs operating across the industry to try and improve compliance, we decided that we needed to kind of step things up a notch and um, we created Every Farm Every Year, which was a program to get to every single shareholder, um, shareholders' farms every year to identify whether they were at risk of non-compliance mm -hmm. and to put some sort of interventions in place to manage that risk. Uh, have you got it operational throughout the entire dairying base now? Yep, we've checked every, every shareholders' farm this year, so that's 10,500 shareholders' farms have had an assessment. Mm -hmm. We've put, um, of, of those shareholders, um, we've identified 2,800 that were at risk. Um, we've put about 1,300 plans in place now, and 700, um, about half of those are, have been already implemented. So, tell tell yeah. me what, what prompted Fonterra to take a lead in this? Uh, why wasn't the, uh, the industry itself taking the leadership? Dairy NZ, which is the, the sort of industry-funded um, body has, has taken a, a huge lead role in um, improving compliance. So they've been working more in terms of you know, mass extension, so field days and toolkits and codes of practice and those sorts of tools for farmers. But in terms of Fonterra's role, we really, um, you know, we've got quite a close relationship with farmers um, behind the farm gate now. And you know, we were uniquely placed to be able to sort of get, get on farm and help them out. Now, when you started out on this, you, you actually have uh have said to uh, another journalist, a colleague of mine, that uh, you were taking farmers on a very challenging journey. That's right. What's so challenging about it? I think in terms of water quality generally in New Zealand, you know, effluent is, is, is an important part, but it's, it is only one part of the equation. And the Clean Streams Accord set out some really challenging targets um, and it, you know, it got, got us to a point um, where you know, there's been a, a high level of um, commitment to, you know, cl um, fencing streams, to having nutrient budgets on farms, and to um, managing effluent compliance. But, but you know, there's always more that you can do. And I think that part of taking responsibility for our environmental footprint is, is, is continuous improvement. Is the improvement comprehensive across the country, 
or are there poor patches? Because we've seen some reports from Southland, from Bay of Plenty, from the far north, where there have been poor compliance uh, rates and some pretty tough fines have been imposed. So is it patchy? Are they bad patches? I think that farmers across the country face the same challenges and yeah. they, they face the same challenges in terms of non-compliance. What I'm seeing is, um, is, is incremental improvement everywhere um, I go on farm. The, I don't think, you know, there's been some regions this year that have had a big, a significant decrease in non-compliance and there's a number of reasons for that. But I think across the country, every, all farmers are working really hard to continuously improve and I think we'll see an incremental improvement in those figures. In every farm every year, you're actually focusing on, on effluent management. But we've got scientists like uh, Angus McIntosh down in Canterbury suggesting that the real problem is the reduction of biodiversity in the, in the waterways. Um, are you listening to those concerns as well and are, are you responding to them? In other words, is this simply about effluent or is it going to be about all of the environmental issues that surround sustainable dairy? Absolutely. I mean... Effluent is only one part of the water quality equation and biodiversity is, a, is another really important part. Um, nutrient management is something that um, is, is front of mind for us at the moment. So looking at you know, giving farmers better tools to improve their performance around um, nitrogen, um, you know, the efficiency with which they're using nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, we've got programs in place around um, in Taranaki, for example, there's an extensive riparian program that's focused on not only biodiversity but just ex ex you know excluding stock from waterways and creating better habitat for um, for fish. And we you know we're, we're involved in supporting those programs. One final question: the dairy herds uh, at the scale now we're um, we're generating 100 million litres of effluent every year. Are we at the point where maybe? Dairying's maxed out. There are great, you know, there's great technologies that are being developed at the moment to manage effluent, and you know we're looking at ways of ways of implementing those technologies. Farmers, you know, New Zealand farmers lead the world in, in picking up technology and and um, creating systems that are you know economically sustainable as well as environmentally sustainable. So you know, I'm really confident that we've got you know technology now and coming in the future that 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 means that we can manage our environmental footprint. Fonterra Sustainable Dairying Field Team Manager Emma Parsons. And next, checking on China as the inflow of fresh produce takes off under the new China-New Zealand Free Trade Agreement. There's more to come in Tower Sector Report. Well, the New Zealand-China Free Trade Agreement has been good for New Zealand so far. In the four years it's been operating, we've seen the value of our dairy exports to China quadruple to more than $2 billion and total exports rise to $5.6 billion. Our imports from China have also continued to grow. The balance of trade is better, but it's still running about $1.4 billion in China's favour. And the latest move to streamline trade and fresh produce between the two countries is generating concern among our local growers. Horticulture New Zealand and the New Zealand Wine Growers Association are worried about new biosecurity processes that are being put in to provide pest and disease control over Chinese produce imports. The Wine Growers Science and Innovations Manager Philip Manson joins me now. Welcome Philip. Tell me what is generating your concern about the biosecurity controls that are being put in place? Well, I think the thing is that uh, there's a whole lot of new, new potential trade, new fruit coming into New Zealand. Um, where there's new trade, there's always risk associated uh, and a, a certain element of unknown elements about that risk. Uh, there's been some pretty good work being done in terms of managing that risk, but uh, certainly in the early stages of trade, the concern would be that the processes and protocols that are put in place, that they've been well managed, and, and looked after uh, well. Well, it's a new fruit, a new country, uh, new opportunities for threats. Do you know exactly what kind of threat could be posed by the produce imports? It's, it's hard to know exactly, but... What are the ones you fear <coughs> most? Well, MAF have done a 
pretty good job of doing a, a risk assessment of all of the pests and diseases that are associated with table grapes in China. Uh, and that's your main area of concern as wine growers? Well, I think any fresh fruit produce coming across the, the border has a risk associated with mm -hmm. it. Look, we're, we're a trading nation. Yep. We understand that it's important to have trade. Uh, the wine sector, we export a, over a billion dollars of wine a year to many countries. Um, the, the horticultural industry, uh, they do another couple of billion uh, dollars worth of trade. So we understand that okay, we need but, to move but, across borders. But how borders. could Chinese table grapes knock you around? Well, it's, it's with the fresh fruit that can come, come across the border, there's also a risk of pests and diseases being associated with that fresh fruit. So the introduction of a new pest or disease can give us a, a major cost in terms of management of those pests and diseases. You're sure uh, you're not sounding a bit like an Australian apple grower who no. for years have stood up and said to New Zealanders, you can't send your apples to our country because you've got a problem. Uh, no, I don't think we are. I think what, we, what we're concerned about is making sure that the protocols that are being put in place, which we think are quite robust, that they're managed well, that they're, the, the systems are implemented well, and in the early stages particularly that MAF are paying a lot of attention that the protocols are being applied rigorously. To be quite blunt with you, I mean, I know that wine growers have had some bumper harvests, but they've been pretty damn tough economic years. Is it biosecurity or competition you're worried about? Well, obviously there's no competition with us around table grapes. Um, we don't grow we, much? We don't grow table grapes. You told me about a trailer load. <laughs> well, it's a little bit more than a trailer load, but certainly uh, you know, we don't have a, a, a table grape industry. Okay, but is it a market protect. that you would wish to diversify into, given the fact that you've got a few problems with, uh, with wine at the moment? No, it's not a market no. that we're okay. interested in. I think the key thing is that, um, I mean, we're, we're actually less affected than perhaps fresh fruit would be around um, the introduction of a new pest. But it does have potential impacts on, if we got a new disease, on our production, on our, on our clean green image, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, on our ability to produce high quality grapes for winemaking. Now, as I understand it, under these new procedures, uh, the fruit that's being exported to New Zealand will actually be, be inspected in China before departure. Is that a matter of concern to you? No, it's the best place for it to be, be happening, um, to have all the pre-border checks, uh, to have all of the systems in place right the way through from, from the vineyard the grapes are grown, through the packing and transportation. So this isn't a matter of you being place. concerned about whether or not the Chinese will do a good job on biosecurity? I think when you get any new trade, if you cast your mind back to when t Californian table grapes were first coming into the country, there were reports of black widow spiders jumping out of bunches in supermarkets. So the issue is when you've got a new, new trade, you have the protocols in place to manage that risk. And then it's important that the systems in place are being uh, audited well and, and are making sure that the protocols, A, are being applied and B, are having the result that you want. And that is the outcome being no... Uh, uh, incidental introductions of pests or diseases associated now, with it. Can I just wonder why wine growers should concern themselves with whether or not there's a black widow spider on a table grape that's in a New Zealand supermarket? Not so much. It's not exactly your field, is it? Not so much worried about the black widow spider, but if there are other things that can, that, uh, can be associated with them that are pests or diseases that affect our crop, then it is a major issue. If it affects other crops, then um, you know it can be an issue as well because in some cases you end up having to manage a pest or a disease for the common good. I've heard you expressing a lot of caution about things, but I haven't heard you saying there's a real problem about this or this or this and we think this kind of change should be made. Have you developed your concern to that point? Have you actually got a set of changes that you are recommending? No, I think we're supportive in general with the, with the trade. Uh, uh, we're, we're supportive with the approaches that, that MAF apply. They're, they're, they're international best practice. What we're, what we're concerned about is when there's any new trade like this, that, that there's uh, appropriate resource put into making sure that the systems are working and, and that they're having the outcomes that are required. The key issue as trade begins on this is to make sure that those systems and those processes are being applied properly. Um, secondly, that they are 
having the um, impact or the, the result that we expect, uh, that there aren't pests or diseases on that, and really just keeping an eye that there's no unintended consequences, that their review picked up everything, basically. Philip Manson, thanks very much. Philip Manson, Science and Innovations Manager for the New Zealand Wine Growers Association. And that's Tower Sector Report for this week. Remember, you can also catch our show anytime on our website, www.country99tv.co.nz. Bye for now.